Okay, in this video we're going to talk about the binomial theorem. And this is a really cool theorem. It comes up a lot in various different places. Okay, we're going to go through sort of an intuitive proof of it in this uh, video and show you some special cases that are pretty interesting. Okay, but before we get into that, let's just start with an example. So the binomial theorem comes up when you have an expression like this. You have some number x plus some number y, and you're raising that quantity, that sum, to some power. Okay, so we're just going to look at raising x plus y to the third power. So x and y can be any numbers you want. And if you wanted to raise this to the third power, what would you do? Well, if you wanted to multiply all of this out, okay, you could list all of these out. And what would you do? Well, you could start with multiplying the first two, and what do you get? You get x squared plus you get x times y and another x times y, so 2xy. Then you get y squared. And then you multiply all of that plus x times x plus y. What do you get? Well, I'll multiply everything by x first. So I get x cubed plus 2x squared y plus xy squared. And now I'll multiply everything by y. So we get x squared y plus 2xy squared plus y cubed. And now I can combine some of these terms. I get x cubed. Now let's look at all the x squared y's. We have 2 there plus 1 more. So that's 3x squared y. And then let's look at all the xy squareds. We have 1 plus 2 more. So that's another 3xy squared. And finally we have the y cubed. Okay, so that's great. So we got x plus y cubed. And you might be saying, yeah, yeah, I don't mind doing all that work. But what if I said x plus y to the 10th power? All right, what if I said to the 21st power? Okay, do we really have to go through and FOIL all this out, or can we just shoot straight to the final answer? Can we just go from here all the way down to there in one step? And it turns out that's what the binomial theorem allows you to do. Okay, so we're going to try and walk through sort of an intuitive proof of how to do that for this example. And then if you wanted, you could easily generalize that thinking to uh, the more general case. Okay, but I think you'll get all the understanding from this example. So one thing I want you to notice about this final answer we got, let's notice each term has exactly, exactly three factors. Okay, what do I mean by that? I just mean each one of these terms has exactly three letters in it, right? Here I have three x's. Here I have two x's and a y. Here I have one x and two y's. Here I have three y's. Okay, so each term has exactly three factors. And then the coefficients out front just tell us how many of those terms we have. Okay, so it turns out, this is what the binomial theorem allows us to do. We can actually obtain, this is sort of like what I was saying before, the last line directly. We can obtain it directly. It's pretty cool. By and I'm going to write this as reinterpreting, in a sense. Uh, reinterpreting um, this product, x plus y times x plus y times x plus y, as how can we reinterpret that? I'll write it in English. This is really sort of saying we have three choices. This might sound a little weird, but this is really what it's saying. We have three choices of x or y. Okay, so I'm going to explain what I mean. Okay, so we have this product here, and it turns out that a lot of the times in math, there's sort of analogies to be made between multiplying and the word and, and between adding and the word or. Maybe you've seen this before, this kind of thinking show up in other places. So the way we're going to reinterpret this line is to say we have our first choice of x or y, right, plus is or, and we have another choice of x or y, and we have a third choice of x or y. Okay? So let's think about it. Okay, if we have three choices of x or y, now I want to try and list out, okay, all the possible um, three choices we could get. Okay, so what's one possible choice we could have? Well, what if we wanted to choose x all three times? Well, we choose x here, we choose x here, we choose x here. Okay, well, how many ways are there to choose x all three times? Well, there's only one. Right? We have to choose x in all three choices. 
And if I did choose x all three times, I would get three x's. So that's x cubed because we're multiplying, right? So that's x cubed. This is, I'm going to choose x three times. And we said, how many ways are there to do that? Well, there's one way. Okay, there's one way. Okay, so I'm going to just multiply that by one. Okay, what other possible choices could I make? Well, I have three choices of x or y. What if I chose x twice and y once? Well, I could do that like this, choose two x's and a y. But that's not the only way this time. I could choose these two x's and that y. Or I could choose those two x's and that y. But that's it. Okay, so there's three different choices, or three different ways I could choose x twice and y once. So, or, this is another option, I can choose x twice and y once. So this is choose x twice and y once. And how many ways are there to do that? There's actually three ways. We just counted them. Okay, there's three ways. What else could happen? Well, I could also choose x once and y twice. x once and y twice. I could choose this x and these two y's. Or I could choose this x and these two y's. Okay. So each one of those factors is going to have one x and two y's. So this is choosing x, twi x once and y twice. And there are also three ways to do that. We just went through them. And then finally, I could just choose y all three times. And there are three ways, just like in the x, x cubed case, or sorry, one way. Just like in the x cubed case, there's only one way to do that. I got to choose y all three times. Okay, and just by thinking of this expression in this way, you can see we actually ended up with the same formula we got doing all the multiplication out. Okay? And it turns out this is, this is a perfectly fine way to think through this product. And if you wanted to go through this line of thinking, if I had x plus y to the fourth or fifth, you absolutely could. Okay, but we can quickly kind of, instead of having to list out all of these ways of choosing by hand, we can quickly understand the overarching pattern, okay, and generalize this. So what did we really do here? What does this really equal? Well, I still have these factors, x cubed, x squared y, xy squared, and y cubed, okay, but how can we count more generally the number of ways of picking x three times? Well, I have three choices of x or y, and this is saying you have to pick x all three times. In other words, from those three choices, you have to pick a subset of size three in which you're going to pick x. Okay, so we have three choices. We need to pick a subset of size three to pick x in each of those uh, elements in the subset. Okay, so how many ways are there to do that? Well, this is exactly what that n choose k notation is for. n choose k gives us the number of subsets of size k you can pick from a set of size n. Here we want the number of subsets of size 3 we can pick from a set of size 3. Well, that's just 3 choose 3, which is 1. There's only one way to do that. Okay, what about x squared y? Well, now I have three choices of x or y, and I want to pick x twice. I want to pick x twice. How many ways are there to do that? That's just counting the number of subsets of size 2 I can take from a set of size 3. And that subset of size 2 just tells me where to choose the x's. Okay, so that's 3 choose 2, which does equal 3. And now xy squared, that's just saying, all right, I need exactly 1x. So I want to count how many subsets of size 1 I can pick from a set of size 3. That's 3 choose 1. And finally, I want 0x's. How many ways are there to pick a subset of size 0 from a set of size 3? That's just 3 choose 0, which is 1. Okay, so this is more generally what's going on. Now we don't have to count these by hand. We can just say, oh, I want exactly two x's, so I have to pick a subset of size 2 from my three choices. That's just 3 choose 2. 3 choose 2. Okay, and I'll just make a note here. 3 choose k is the number of ways to pick x k times out of the three choices. And that's exactly what we wanted to count, right? Because each one 
of those uh, ways to pick xk times will give me exactly one factor, x squared y, or for k, x to the k times y, y to the n minus 1, right? Because that's the other thing. That's the next step, right? If we have x squared y, we need three factors total, right? Because we have three choices. So how can we better understand all of these terms here? Well, we can say, oh, I'm going to choose x some number of the times. Here I chose x all three times. Here I chose it twice. Here I chose it once. There I chose it zero times. So how many factors of y would I have? Well, I have to choose y all the remaining times, right? I have to choose y all the remaining times. So if I chose x three times, there's no places to choose y, so it's just times y to the zero. If I choose x only two times, then y has to take up all the remaining. That's three minus two, right? So it's just one. If I choose x only once, y has to be all the remaining choices, so that's three minus one, which is two. And if I never choose x, then I have to choose y all three minus zero times. Okay, so that's how we can better understand those factors. And if we put all that together, if we put all that together in general, okay, what would we get? We would get x plus y to the n. How can we write this? Well, let's just follow the same pattern, right? I'm going to have an option to choose x all n times. How many ways are there to do that? That's just n choose m, which is just 1. Or I could have a factor that looks like n to x to the n minus 1, and what would it have to be multiplied? How many y's are left? Well, if I choose x n minus 1 times, right, then there's only one y left. n minus n minus 1 is just 1. And there's n choose n minus 1 ways to pick x n minus 1 times out of those n factors. Okay, plus x to the n minus 2. Well, if there's n minus 2 x's, there's two choices left over for y. And how many different ways are there to make such a choice? Well, there's n choose n minus 2 ways. Okay, plus dot dot dot, plus what if I get down to the term uh, just x, just 1x, just picking 1x out of the n, then I have to pick y, the remaining n minus 1 times. There's n choose 1 ways to do that. And then finally, I could pick x 0 times and just pick y all n times. There's n choose 0 ways to do that, which is just 1. Okay, and we can write this more concisely. We can write this more concisely. Right, this is just a big sum, so I'm going to use a summation. Okay, and now I need a variable of my summation to associate with each of these terms, and I'm just going to pick arbitrarily the power of x. Okay, you could do the power of y if you want it, doesn't matter. Okay, I'm just going to choose the power of x, and I'll call that k. Okay, so where do the powers of x start? Well, they start with x to the 0, x to the 1, all the way up to x to the n. So that's k equals 0 all the way up to n, right? If I have n choices, I could pick x, 0, all the way to n times. Okay, now I just have to describe each of these terms using this variable k. Okay, and we, we said k is going to be my power of x, so I have x to the k. But each of these factors has to have exactly n terms, right? That's what we started with. I have to make n choices. So if I choose x k times, I have to choose y n minus k times. And how many ways are, are there to choose x k times? Well, it's just n choose k. Okay, so you can see that this equation right here is writing this whole mess just more concisely. It's the same thing. And this is the binomial theorem. x plus y to the n equals this sum. So it's not something you have to memorize. You know, we just explained all the reasoning. I've never memorized this. I just walk through this reasoning every time, and you can obtain this formula. It's pretty cool. We're just reinterpreting this equation up here in a different way. So I'll just make a note of that. This is the binomial theorem. Okay, so that's the binomial theorem. So if you were ever on a test, you know, and you had some expression that looked like this, right, instead of actually multiplying everything out, foiling it out, you could just think through it and actually jump straight to the answer if you know these binomial coefficients. Okay, but those aren't, aren't hard to figure out either. Okay, so let's just look at some examples of kind of interesting special cases of this binomial theorem. Let's first take an easy one. Let's say what happens when x and y are both 1, right? What happens in this equation if x and y are both 1? Well, on that side, I'm just going to get 1 plus 1 to the n, and that's going to equal, right, what if x and y are both 1? The sum from k equals 0 up to n of n choose k times 1 to the k times 1 to the n minus k. Right, that's just plugging in x and y are both 1. 
So what do I get? Well, on this side, I get 2 to the n, right? 1 plus 1 to the n, that's 2 to the n. And on this side, I just get the sum k equals 0 to n of n choose k. Okay, I'm not sure if I said it, but sometimes these are called binomial coefficients. For this reason, they appear as coefficients in the binomial theorem. Okay, so the sum of the binomial coefficients for a given n, k is just 2 to the n. Well, that's kind of a nice, clean formula. Is there a different way to interpret it? Well, there is, yeah. So if you remember the definition of n choose k, this is just the number of subsets of size k from a set of size n. Okay, that's what n choose k means. It just counts the number of subsets of size k from a set of size n. So what are we doing with this sum? What are we doing with this sum? Well, what we're doing is we're just adding up, we're just adding up the number of subsets of size k for all the different values of k. k could be one, 0, 1, 2, all the way up to n. Okay, we're just adding up the number of subsets of every possible size for a subset, right? A subset can have size 0, that's just the empty set taking nothing, all the way up to n taking everything. We're just adding up the number of subsets of each size. What is that really counting? That's just counting the total number of subsets of a set of size n. And we just use the binomial theorem, just an algebraic identity, we use the binomial theorem to show that that actually equals 2 to the n. That's pretty cool. Right, so the total number of subsets of a set of size n, we use the binomial theorem here to show that that actually equals 2 to the n. Okay, there are other ways to get that same result, you know, using kind of a count, different types of counting principles. Okay, but this is pretty cool that you can use the binomial theorem to show it as well. So the total number of subsets of a set of size n is just 2 to the n. All right, so that was the first example. Let's do another one. Okay, what if x is negative 1 and y is 1? What do we get then? Well, plugging into the binomial theorem, okay, on this side we're going to get negative 1 plus 1 to the n, and over here I'm going to plug in negative 1 for x and 1 for y. So I'll just do that down here. So I'm going to get negative 1 plus 1 to the n, and the binomial theorem tells us that equals n choose k, negative 1 to the k times 1 to the n minus k. So over here I just get 0, right? 0 to the n is just 0. And over here, I get the sum from k equals 0 to n of n choose k. This goes away, and I just get minus 1 to the k. So what's this sum doing? Well, when k is 0, this is 1. So I add n choose 0, and then I just alternate, adding, subtracting, adding, subtracting all of these binomial coefficients. And amazingly, for any n, that will always give me 0. Okay, so we can show this. We can test it out a little bit. We can actually use Pascal's triangle. Maybe you've encountered this before. Pascal's triangle looks like this. It starts with 1, and then you put two ones, and then on the left and right side you always add ones, and anywhere in the middle you add the two numbers sort of up and to the left and up and to the right. So 1 plus 1 is 2, and I get 1, add these, I get 3, 3, 1, 1, 4, 6, 4, 1, 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1, and so on. Okay, and it turns out up here, this is the n equals 0 row, this is n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, n equals 5, and you can keep going forever, I'll just stop here. But what's cool about Pascal's triangle is that in any given row, like if we look here at this row, that's actually the binomial coefficients, if you read them left to right. This is 3 choose 0, 3 choose 1, 3 choose 2, 3 choose 3. And it's true in any row. So this is 5 choose 0, this is 5 choose 2. Right? It's true in any row. So if you need to use the binomial theorem and you want the binomial coefficients, it might be easy to just sort of write out Pascal's triangle. You can do each subsequent row pretty quickly. Okay, so first let's actually check what we just saw previously. Okay, that if I add up all the binomial coefficients for a given n, I get 2 to the n. In Pascal's triangle, that just means we're going to add up all the binomial coefficients in a given row. 
we should get 2 to that row number. 1 plus 3 is 4, plus 3 is 7, plus 1 is 8. What do you know? That's 2 to the third power, that's 8. 1 plus 5, that's 6, plus 10 is 16, plus 10 is 26, plus 5 is 31, plus 1 is 32, and yeah, that's 2 to the 5. So that's pretty cool. Now let's test this one out. We're going to add and subtract binomial coefficients in a given row. So we have 1 minus 3, that's negative 2, plus 3, that's 1, minus 1 is 0. 1 minus 5, that's negative 4, plus 10, that's 6, minus 10 is negative 4, plus 5 is 1, minus 1 is 0. Okay, and of course, we proved it using binomial theorem. It's definitely true, but you can feel free to write some more rows out and test it again. Okay, but that um, is, is always a true statement. If you add and subtract alternating all the binomial coefficients in a given row, you just get zero. Okay, so that's pretty cool. And I'll let you think about how you can actually prove that using this method of making Pascal's triangle, right, where you add the kind of up to the left, up to the right numbers, how you might be able to show that if you keep doing that, you actually do get these binomial coefficients. You can think of maybe the combinatorial identity you would e need there and then think through how to prove that. That'd be a good little exercise to try out. Okay, but we're going to focus on the binomial theorem for now. And so that was another cool example. Let's do one more. Let's do one more. So x plus y equals 1. Okay, this is going to be our other special case. In other words, i.e., that is, I'll just use y equals 1 minus x. Okay, so I'm going to put everything in terms of x here. So what does the binomial theorem say? I'm going to add x plus y to the n, and then I'm just going to plug in I'm going to keep x, and I'm going to plug in 1 minus x for y. Okay, so let me go down here. So on this side, I'm going to have x plus y, that's x plus 1 minus x to the n. And the binomial theorem says that equals the sum, n choose k, x to the k, and then y was 1 minus x to the n minus k. Okay, and what do I get on this side? x plus 1 minus x is just 1, so we get 1 to the n, and that's just 1. Okay, so this is pretty crazy that if I take a big sum of all these binomial coefficients times some number x to the k times 1 minus x to the n minus k, somehow when I add all of that up, I just get 1. This is for any n and for any x, as long as y equals 1 minus x. Okay, and this seems pretty incredible, but there actually is another way to interpret this. Okay, it's actually an even further special case if x happens to be, be between 0 and 1. In that case, we might see, uh, you might have seen this before, or maybe we'll see it sometime in the future. Okay, it turns out that this part, each one of these summands, actually has an interpretation using probability. Okay, if x is between 0 and 1, it could be the probability of something. That means 1 minus x is, always, is also a probability. And it turns out there's a way to interpret this using probability, it turns out this expression here is actually the probability of getting exactly k heads in n flips of a coin where that coin might not be fair. It might not be 50-50 heads or tails, but actually the probability of getting a heads is that number x right there. Okay, so if x happens to be between 0 and 1, we can interpret it using probability in this way. And if that's true, then what's this right side doing? If that's true, then this right side is just adding up this probability okay, for k equals 0, 1, 2, all the way to n. Okay, and adding up this probability for k equals 0, 1, 2, all the way to n, what does that mean? That means we're adding the probability you get exactly 0 heads in n flips, plus probability you get exactly 1 head in n flips, plus the probability you get exactly 2, hands in n fl 2 heads in n flips, all the way to the probability you get all n heads. Well, that's everything, right? That's everything, right? So if we add up all that probability, that's like saying the total would be the probability that we get some number of heads in n flips. Well, we always get some number of heads, right? So when we add up all this probability for all those k values, we get 
adding up all this gives the total probability of getting any number of heads in n flips, which of course is just one, right? One is like the total probability. You can see, we see that right there. Okay, because if we flip the coin n times, we're gonna get some number of heads, right? And this is just adding up the probability, we get exactly zero, one, two, all the way to n heads. That gives the total probability of getting any number of heads in n flips, which of course is just one. But it's cool that we were able to actually prove this here using the binomial theorem. Okay, it's just an algebraic identity, but it turns out it's actually proving this statement about probability. So pretty interesting. Of course, there's many, many more examples. I just think these three are pretty cool and it kind of shows off how powerful uh, the binomial theorem can be and how it can appear in various different contexts. Great, so that's all I had for this video. I'll see you in the next one.